All right. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. All right, uh, we're going to begin interviewing you now. Uh, we're about to we're about to start the interviewing you, and if you have any like further questions about like anything with regards to the consent form or in regards to the picture you might take a picture, let us know. But um, can you please share your name and when and where you are born? Yes, my name is Vernon Verhoof. I go by Vern, so I'm happy if you call me Vern. Yeah, I was born in uh, Primgar, Iowa in 1950. So that makes me 73 years old, or 73 years young. Exactly, still really young. And um, so when and why did you first move to New Jersey? When and why? Moved to New Jersey in 1995, and I was with a pharmaceutical company in Chicago, Illinois area, uh, Boots Pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. And Boots had to withdraw a, a new product that they had just launched uh, from the marketplace because they got long-term safety data in, which wasn't which wasn't advantageous to the product. In fact, it was detrimental to the product. So Boots was put up for sale and yeah. BASF, um, which had the, the Knoll Pharmaceuticals here in New Jersey, uh, picked up Boots and then merged it with their company and their headquarters was located here rather yeah. than the Chicago area. So it was really a relocation based on my, my job. And, um... I have part of the question list, but like, do you enjoy New Jersey overall? I do. It was a remarkable, pleasant surprise, I have to say. Um, <laughs> I love yeah, Chicago right. <laughs> area, but, uh, you know, the word was, uh, the word in the Midwest is, you know, why would you want to move to New Jersey? You know, it's just all <laughs> steel and, and uh, shipping yards and concrete. And, and I, I get here, and my first trip is to... Uh, I think drive to a Morristown area and uh, I'm driving by trees. I don't see any people, you know, I don't see where <laughs> are the cities. What's all this stuff that everyone's talking about. So ended up uh, settling in uh, Morristown and it is, I've been here longer than I've lived any other place in my life. It's almost 30 years now. So um, access to highways, train station, airports, um, our train ride into the city. What more is there? You know, it's it's really really quite wonderful, and we have a, a great community here in in town. I know. And um, in contrast to that, how was it like growing up for you with your family in um, Iowa? Mm, sorry, ask that one more time. Um, how was it like growing up with your family in um, Iowa as a as a young adult, as a child? Um, a little bit about Iowa and growing up. Yeah. Um, so I grew up on a farm. My dad had a uh, quarter of a section. A section is a square mile. A quarter of a section is, you know, if you divide it uh, in, in fourths, um, you end up with 160 acres. And on that farm, he had a little bit of everything. He had, uh, we, the main, major crops were corn and soybeans, but we also had, um, you know, some alfalfa hay to feed the cattle, some uh, oats, uh, and a lot of different kinds of animals, chickens, roosters for butchering for the wintertime, uh, pigs, cow, milk cows, um, cattle. Mom had a huge garden. Um, I was involved with chores, gathering the eggs, helping dad milk the cows first by hand, then later by machine. Um, of some interest, you might find it of interest and maybe unbelievable, but I grew up without running water in the house for 16 years. Wow. In fact, the cows got running water before the house did. Um, wow. when, when dad put in a, uh, a, a hydrant system throughout the farm, the farm mm -hmm. animals were, were had the running water, but we did not in our house until uh, I was about 16 years old. So, but it was, it was a great place to grow up. Um, I have seven brothers and sisters. 
I was number seven of eight. Uh, and uh, so I had a little brother, had a little older sister, about five years apart. I was in, in between them. You know, but there's there's hunting rabbits and squirrels and pheasants and there's fishing in the little pond down the street. There's sledding in the wintertime. There's tobogganing. Um, we spent a lot of time outdoors. Sometimes we'd ride bikes around the section, my sister and I, and just having a, it, um, a, a freeing time. Yeah. I guess if I would say that there's anything that... Um, was that I missed when I was growing up. I missed contact with the outside world. I mean, I didn't know it. I just knew the world was bigger, but my world was very, very, very small and contained. Wow. That's definitely interesting, especially with the running water. I can't have yeah. it. <laughs> yep. There's no water. <laughs> especially in the wintertime. Let me, especially let me in the winter. <laughs> Not fun to go outside. Um, well, thank you for sharing a little bit about your background. Um, I'm going to transition and ask for, towards the career now. Yeah, um, I'm Jade Alexandra, political science major, sophomore. And um, I just want to ask you about um, how can you describe your local schools when you're okay? Yeah, good question. Um, the farm was located four miles outside of Sanborn. Iowa Sanborn is a little uh, trail, a, a little railroad town, um, had about 1,200 people. And in Sanborn, we had two schools. We had the public school and we had the Christian school. I went to the Christian school, uh, parochial school, uh, private school. So uh, I was there for eight years from first grade to eighth grade. And then I went on to... Um, a neighboring town about 25 miles away or 30 miles from the farm, which was called Hull. And it was Western Christian High School. So I, I spent eight uh, years in elementary in Christian school and then an additional four years in high school and in a Christian school. I was, um, Christian school was an important component of our, the religion that my family was involved with. We were, um, Christian Reformed is the denomination. It's Protestant. It's um, uh, Christian Reformed is primarily uh, people of Dutch descent. Um, it's uh, relatively conservative. We uh, their their identity was tied to differentiating themselves from the Reformed Church of America. In the Christian Reformed Church, the members were expected to send their kids to the Christian school and not to the public school. They believed that religion was such an integral part of the life that it needed to be expressed in school, in church, and in the family itself. So it was, uh, that was, um, that was just part of the tradition that I grew up with. All, all, all eight kids went through the Christian schools and Christian high school. Um, can you explain how um, your religious background and schooling impacted your career path in any way? Uh, yeah. Like yeah, it was early. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Uh, I'm thinking back to the speakers we would get in uh, for our church. And for the school, um, we believed in a concept of missionaries and missionaries went to foreign countries. You know, everything I'm saying now is just looking back at the way it was at that point in time. I'm not defending yes or no or right or wrong, but missionaries. And so they would come in and they would tell about their work in Ceylon or in Africa or, uh, you know, somewhere halfway around the world. And they'd talk about working with the local people. And I always thought, oh, man, that is awesome. And so from a very young age, at five years old, I, um, I had the idea I wanted to be a medical doctor when I grew up. That, that, that was because there were two important people in our town as far as I was concerned. The preacher of our church, you know, he was next to God, you know, and then there's the 
the physician in town who actually came out and did house calls. And um, he was, he made me feel better. And so uh, I wanted to be like him. And somewhere along the line, I was given for Christmas a little doctor's kit, you know, with the play, the play syringes, the play, uh, you know, hammers that you could tap on the knee and the play stethoscope. And I was going around being doctor. And so, and then as I heard the messages and the stories about different parts of the world, I thought, oh my goodness, I want to be a medical missionary. So that was my goal. That was my center. That was my focus. Um, and when I got to high school, I loved biology, just loved biology. And I thought, this is great. This is what way, way I want to go. And so I, I um, graduated high school. And then for college, I ended up going to a college 700 miles from Iowa in Michigan, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Calvin College, it was one of the three options that were acceptable to my parents, essentially. They were all, there were three colleges that were associated with the Christian Reformed Church. Calvin was one, uh, Dort was another, and then there was a small private Trinity College in the Chicago area. I chose Calvin because it was the farthest way from home and I wanted to experience everything that I could possibly experience. And Calvin was well known and had a good pre-medical program. So that's where I, where I went on and, uh, and uh, pursued my dream of becoming a medical missionary. It, um, it, go ahead. No, no. Um, I was uh, curious about, your career path after Calvin College in admission. After Calvin, yep. So I didn't get into medical school. Dream crashed, right? What to do? What to do? Well, I uh, got married. And, uh, you know, with not, not much money to my name, we lived very, very inexpensively. My wife became a nurse. She worked as an LPN. And I floundered around. I worked at a car dealership. And I thought, well, maybe I could sell cars. I was selling parts for cars. And the fellow told me, the, the CEO told me, nope, this is not for you. Um, and so I looked for options and I um, thought that, well, okay. I loved it. two of the professors at Kelvin. I went back and audited their classes. And then I applied to graduate school in three areas. It was um, biochemistry, microbiology, and uh, physiology. Got into biochemistry at Michigan State and um, achieved that degree in 1978. And then uh, was uh, picked up and, uh, at, um, by St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And it's like... Man, for a young guy, that was like hitting the jackpot. It was amazing. Uh, I mean, there was no question why I was there. I'm walking past these kids, these kids at the, uh, you know, who are there for chemotherapy. I'm going up to the third floor to the pharmacology department, and I'm working with their blood cells, and I'm working on, I'm working on finding better ways to treat their leukemias, um, making the antimetabolites that we use uh, safer and better and more effective and more specific. And uh, spent eight years there, research, papers, cancer research, it, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. But I had a growing family and St. Jude didn't pay me much. Our third child was born in Memphis. And so I ended up going into the pharmaceutical industry and that uh, took me, it took me first to uh, Columbus, Ohio. Then it took me to um, uh, Rochester, New York, then Chicago, and then finally here, 18 years in the pharmaceutical industry. And um, it ran its course and uh, in 2004, I walked away from it after I'd put my kids through college, essentially, and uh, looked for a, a way to kind of restart my life. Um, what inspired you to participate in the organizing? Uh, say it one more time. What inspired you to start participating in community organizing? Yes. 
that's uh, probably one of my favorite questions. I um, so after kind of uh, this time of teaching, 2016, I uh, kind of ended my teaching career. That was after pharmaceutical industry. Um, I was always heavily involved with uh, church throughout my years and throughout all the towns that we lived in. And uh, here in Morristown, I was part of the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. And we engaged in two major initiatives, uh, kind of in the years 2016 to, 2016 to 2020. One initiative was under the umbrella of undoing racism. So we linked up uh, Presbyterian Church in Morristown with a church in Harlem, the Rendell Presbyterian Church in Harlem in Manhattan, or, you know, upper, upper there. And uh, about 10 of us from each church would meet, we would discuss, we'd argue, we'd talk about racism. And one of the things we did was go on a 2,400 mile trip by van in the Southern United States. We flew into Atlanta, rented a couple of vans and about 10 of us from each of the churches were, were spent a couple of weeks together. We went through six or seven states and uh, it was life-changing for me. I won't elaborate on that unless you ask me about that. But for me, that was life-changing. And it gave me a perspective on myself and who I am as an Anglo-Saxon, white, Protestant male, and, and even an older one, you know? And I learned a lot about um, structural racism and uh, white privilege. So that was, that was huge. The other thing that I experienced in those years, 2016 to 2020 was an initiative uh, with, that we worked on with Foundation for Peace. Our church is connected with Foundation for Peace, which has sites in Haiti, in Dominican Republic and Kenya. And their, their philosophy was to go into a community and, and work hand in hand. It's not that we know what they need, they know what they need, they know what they have to have. And so a small team of us, just five or six of us from the Presbyterian church uh, went there, um, oh, I wanna say 2017, spent 10 days, we worked on uh, helping them paint their church. It was a block uh, structured church and we helped them uh, paint the block building that they were constructing. And we lived with them. We ate the, we ate the food, we, ate, we lived right in town. Um, we had three worship service, joint worship services with them. But the big thing that, that really impacted me we went back two more times so so a uh, total of three times to the same place same community worked on a community center worked on a you know a, a block wall around a, a playground for the safety of the children but the big thing is we we spent time talking to the leaders of the community uh the men and women who were the leaders of the community in albate and we would just sit around and talk about what their hopes and dreams are for the future. And uh, as the, the third year we were there, you know, the room was just packed. Everybody wanted to talk. Everybody wanted to listen. And one of, one of our, one of our uh, team members from the PCM said, you know, we've gotten to know you uh, the people of Albate so much better than we even know our neighbors back in the States. So, you know, this is all done through translators. So one of the very wise persons uh, that lives in Albate, one of the, uh, one of the um, female leaders in the church and in the community just basically looked at us and said, why don't you go home and get to know your neighbors? You know, that's just kind of startling. And it's, uh, it's and, and, and uh, it, 
it had an impact on me. So the, those were two big things um, that is background. And then um, organizing came along because, you know, undoing racism had kind of run its course. We had done everything we, we could do with the Harlem church and we needed to somewhere to put it. And our pastor at the church said, you know, New Jersey Together is a good organization that's solid. They're, they, they're an active, I mean, an action organization. This is where you can maybe begin to address some of the structural racism that we see in our state and in our local communities. And I thought, well, yeah, that sounds pretty good. You know, and then Frank McMillan, uh, the lead organizer for um, this area, uh, Jersey City Together, and uh, came out and gave a talk to us at our church and, you know, he asked for people to sign up and I thought, well, not yet. But as the, as the time, time went by and you see, you see these, the police killings of people of color, the George uh, Floyd event where the white policeman is bending his knee on top of George Floyd and, um, and I get to wondering, okay, who am I? Who am I in that picture? Am I the policeman? Am I the white guy? Am I the white guy? You know? And I can't just stand by. I just can't stand by. So there was a, a culmination of a lot of mass murders, um, killings, and just, you know, the anger builds up, some motivation comes out of my experiences in Dominican Republic, my experiences with undoing racism, and the anger that builds up, and the need to put that anger somewhere, the need to put it somewhere. So I think that's kind of, that's how I moved into, into organizing, and I said yes, and, um, and then I began, and, uh, trying to get Morris area together off the ground by doing a listening campaign and and uh, working with the leaders as they try to get uh, get uh, organizations to commit uh, people and money. I hope that answers it. Yeah. Uh, how would you describe um, organize? How, how does organize fulfill your need to not feel like a bystander? In the... Yeah. First of all, one of the strategies for building yeah, Morris Area Together is a listening campaign. And uh, there's two ways to do it. You can do it as kind of a survey. You have set questions. You know, how, how has your life been? And this is, we're trying to get this launched during COVID, which is difficult. But you can go around and you can talk to people. How's your life been in the past year? You know, well, what would you like to see different in the community? You know, is there an area in education and policing and in uh, housing? You know, what, what kind of... Uh, what kind of issues do you see? So you interview a couple of thousand people and you do it kind of systematically. I had to interview 10 or 12 and that's fine. So I go and ask my friends and I'm thinking, well, this is a little awkward because, you know, I'm the people I know are pretty comfortable, right? Upper middle class, you know, I'm retired. I don't really need a, a job to survive at this point in time. I don't have a, food scarcity issue, but you know, as you listen and you expand the, the listening campaign, then you start hearing the issues that are emerging. And, um, and then you, 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 you know, you struggle, but you find ways uh, to uh, prioritize the issues. Well, we prioritized three of them and it was in uh, the area of criminal justice, um, housing, in mental health so uh, how can it uh, so not just a bystander i'm now a listener and another big important component of building community is doing one-on-one -on -one, uh, relational building 
And that's kind of at the heart of how um, an organiza- organization is built from the ground up. A lot of one-on-one meetings. And um, you, you, you do it with someone you admire or who, who looks interesting to you and you sit down and you really don't have an agenda. You just tell your story about what you're enthusiastic about, what you're involved with, how you got there, and the other person tells the story. And I've met so such amazing people that in in an hour space over coffee, um, suddenly you begin to see beyond your own little world. Um, I, uh, uh, Andre, you know, is one person I interviewed. He grew up in the in the uh, um, Manahan Village in Morristown, went to the local schools. You know, he moved into Morristown where, you know, there, there were a limited number of places in Morristown where he, as a person of color, could live. So I hear the story and I hear what he's doing now. He's a teacher at the middle school, you know, and he's trying to get the people in his community, still lives in Manahan Village. He's trying to help them find their voices. And so it's a way of me getting to know people who have experiences outside my, my experience and have issues that are, are important. And one of the issues was, you know, the landlords or the, the public housing in Morristown weren't taking care of repairs. And so these are things we can address. Uh, we can put pressure on the town to get the repairs fixed as needed. And so little by little, um, my world becomes bigger. And I think that helps. That helps me no longer feel a bystander. When it happens to you, it happens to me. And um, uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Um. How would you describe uh, your approach to navigating multicultural and multiracial spaces? While- yeah, that's really important. And I think that's where the undoing racism really helped me out. Um, I, I need to know who I am in community. I need to know how I'm perceived. And um, I'll just run it down. I'm a a white male, elderly. I have a lot of white privilege. I can walk through most any door, right? I have a lot of white privilege. And I understand that that is not everyone. That is not everyone. So when I'm in, uh, when I'm talking to people, my job is to shut up. I love to talk, you know, but people really don't need to hear me. They need to hear each other. They need to hear the the person on the fringe. They need to hear the person who's hurting. They need the person to hear the person who really has life struggle issues right now, right here in this place. And so my job is to be quiet and listen, 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 listen. And then as we move and as issues arrive, then it's a matter of, okay, highlighting the issue. And I can't tell which, I can't tell a group which way to go, how to solve it, but I can nudge them in directions. I have to take a back seat is, is how I need to navigate through the multicultural situations. And listening is just a huge part of that. Um. Are there any uh, partner organizations that you are part of um, currently, such as religious institutions? Yeah, it's, um, uh, of course, I mentioned the Presbyterian Church in Morristown, but the other church I'm pretty heavily involved with is uh, Bethel AME Church in Morristown. And that came about, well, Bethel AME is, this year is celebrating its 180th anniversary and it turns out that they split off of the Presbyterian Church in Morristown. They emerged from that. We actually, in the 1800s, well, it would be 180 years ago, the Presbyterian Church also split into two buildings. But it wasn't just a two-way split. It was a three-way split because 
um, uh, Fannie Ray uh, decided uh, that the African Americans that were attending our church with the very specific places where they could sit uh, needed to have a, a church of their own. And so she got the ball rolling to get a Bethel AME started. Bethel AME I, um, celebrated their 175th five years ago. And because we were the initiating church, we were asked to, um, to talk at the kickoff uh, prayer meeting. And it was held in our chapel of the Presbyterian Church. Now, I hear from the pastor, Pastor Sidney of Bethel AME, that, you know, the African-Americans say, why do we have to go in that white church? You know, well, you know, this is where it started. It turned out that I was asked to give a talk to give reflections on undoing racism. Pastor Sidney knew our church was involved with that with Harlem and, you know, three years. So, you know, what came of that? So I gave about a five minute speech on my reflections of undoing racism. And um, it was it was powerful for me because I, I, I didn't really hold back. I, I did a lot of self self reflecting on terms of my religion, my inadequate education, my complicity. Um, in structural racism, you know, I didn't hold back. And it was it was a powerful moment for the people who were there and Pastor Sidney himself. Um, I think it changed our relationship. It changed our relationship. When, um, an, uh, you know, an elderly white man can stand up and say, I am racist. And I'm doing something about that and help me, it goes a long ways. So Bethel AME became a, a, a place and, and what they have that I became involved with is they have a huge food distribution network that emerged uh, before COVID hit. We had uh, evening meals. Well, they had a flood back in 2011. And when uh, the churches helped them renovate their building, they dedicated the basement to God. And out of that base, in that basement, we would have evening meals for anybody who needed to have an evening meal. I was involved with uh, dishing out the meals, bringing it around to the people sitting around the tables, um, serving them coffee, drinks, often sitting with the people who would come in and just talk about how their day went. And um, COVID hit and we don't stop because people are still hungry. And so we would make the meals and hand them out the front door. So I was heavily involved with that. I've become more involved lately with uh, gathering the food from like, oh, Wegmans, Costco, Kings, Target, you know, you name it. There's a lot of food that goes to waste, but we have a way of, of gathering it and then redistributing it uh, through, um, uh, distribution centers in Morristown and Parsippany and Dover uh, once a week. We continue the evening meal program. And um, I've done a couple of promotional videos for them and I've gotten our church more heavily involved in Table of Hope because I think, I think that's where, that's what church is. That's what church is about. If it can't take care of the people in its community, uh, people who, um, have to make a choice whether they eat or go to the doctor and in our community. Uh, and if we sit by, yeah, shame on us. Um, I'm gonna move now to uh, the, specifically the New Jersey to gather uh, community history to yep. my partner here. And he's gonna start asking questions. Hello. Uh, Hi. My name is Alfred, and I'm going to talk about, ask you questions about the NJ, NJ Together community history. Uh, one question would uh, I would like to ask is, what was your first meeting or training with the uh, the G New Jersey Together like? Yeah, I remember it well. Um, 
it was in our church. It was a presentation by Frank McMillan. Frank was uh, the lead organizer, I think, for Jersey City Together. He was highly experienced, uh, enormously charismatic presence. Our pastor who saw, you know, the Undoing Racism Project coming to an end thought that maybe this was a way forward. So he asked Frank to come in and, you know, say, what about, could we do something like that here, not just in Jersey City, but maybe in Morris County, Morristown. And so Frank gave the uh, talk and you've probably heard it in your, in your classes. I think of it as the three-legged stool it's the power structure in our community. There's the power of um, government, there's the power of corporations, and then there's the power of the rest of us, the nonprofits. And if we don't have all three legs functioning at an equal level, it gets terribly unbalanced. And that's where the uh, disparities um, oh, come, come down through. So he talked about that. And uh, then, of course, he invited people to sign up and, you know, get more information. And I wasn't ready to sign up. But, you know, but it, it stuck with me. It stuck with me. And I think uh, the next part is there were enough people to begin the listening campaign in Morris County. I got, yeah, I can ask four or five people. You know, I can ask a dozen people questions. That's easy enough. And um, so I participated with that. And and slowly, 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 I got absorbed into it until I, I went to a training to find out what was more, 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 what was it about? So, yeah, it was not gung ho, but, you know, slowly, slowly absorbed the message. Interesting. Um, another question would be, uh... Uh, what is the great greatest impact you feel that NJ New Jersey Together has had on your community? Yeah. I when I answered this question, I I just wrote this sentence. Church and synagogue leaders are leaning into each other. Do you know what I mean? They're starting to the work together is work together, listen to each other, feel some of the pain of each other, you know, some of the hurt. You know, there is a there is a uh, what, clergy council, which is supposed to represent all of the clergy in the Morristown area, you know, but it's easy to get caught up in your own world. And New Jersey together, I think is another way of helping people gather in a space uh, beyond their religious boundaries, if you know what I mean. And I think that's just good. And um, you know, we're young. We're young in Morris. We're young in Morris County. Um, we don't have a full-fledged Morris area together. We're kind of a satellite. We have six or seven committed organizations with people and money, but that's that's not sustainable. So, you know, but we're we're struggling to get to get that to to grow that and be and and uh, and become stronger. So I look forward to to more, but but people are talking and people are listening to each other. Yeah. Sorry, right now. So you would so you would say you like you like to see more of what's happening, the actions between like people. Yeah, I mean, for me, what I can do, um, it's the one-on-one -on -one interactions. It's the it's the. Uh, I would love to see us, you know, identify an issue that is clearly actionable. And that, you know, we can have a, 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 a big campaign and have, you know, the music, the energy, the uh, representatives from government that we need to respond and work with us in front of us, that we can have people who are affected by an issue. You know, I dream of that and I've seen it happen 
in other places, in other situations, in training, they show videos of actions taking place in Jersey City. And uh, also I was part of one in Chicago. It's amazing, it's beautiful. And if it's done well, um, you have, you know, the government officials and they can be fairly high up. They can be um, mayors of, uh, the mayor of Chicago was present in the Chicago event, you know, and we had uh, state representatives there as well. And they need to say, uh, they don't get to talk all of their political nonsense. They need to answer very specific questions. Will you support X, Y, Z? And um, it's powerful. It's powerful. I mean, I come out of that meeting. We're just on a high. And, you know, there was a chant. And I don't know if it started in the meeting or after the meeting. But this is what I felt. You know, it's a call and response. Who has the power? We have the power. It's not I have the power. We have the power. And that, that, I mean, if we can get to the we, that is, is huge. And when you got a couple of thousand people saying that, you suddenly believe that change can happen. So, so yeah, I dream of that day for, for Morristown and our communities. See that happens in the near future. Pardon? Um, let's see what uh, let's see what happens in the near future. Yes, it could happen. Yes. Uh, another question would be: Is is there any like is there what is one challenge your organization has faced, and how did you like steer clear of it of the situation? Yeah, and it's continuing to this day. We tried to launch Morris Area Together during COVID. Mm -hmm. It's not the same. Zoom is not the same as being in a room with a thousand people you just yeah. it's just not the same the energy is not there i mean you can do a lot but you can't do it all and so um so we're trying to launch a dream COVID, and then we also lost our uh, the lead organizer that you know introduced it to us frank mcmillan he went on he relocated to the washington dc area so so the challenge, and we face it yet to this day, is that we have, like I said, six or seven committed organizations, but we need, you know, double, triple that number really to be self-sustaining and grow a power organization in the county that can be mobilized to really focus and uh, confront government or corporations as needed. Um, I am just so pleased. Um, that very recently, within the last couple of months, uh, a, a senior advisor from our organization, uh, Industrial Areas Foundation, his name is Michael Geekin, has stepped in and is helping us to refocus our efforts in the Morris area, particularly. Uh, you might have heard of his book, Going Public. It's a great book uh, for organizers and leaders. Um, and he's a, I've gotten to know him very quickly over the last uh, few weeks. And uh, he's just top notch. He holds his organizers accountable. Um, he keeps them focused on what they should be focused on. And, uh, he's, uh, and he's teaching us to separate organizer responsibility from leader responsibility. And um, so I think I have to say it's a work in progress. We're not through through the, uh, the issue of really getting a strong Morris area together launched. But again, I'm hopeful no matter how it settles out that with Michael's advice now we can we can move forward. So it's like slow, it's not that like as fast, but it's like slowly growing back to like pre-COVID. Yes, exactly, exactly. And we've had to, we've had to now focus on organizations. We need to, we need to have, you know, at least 15 organizations committed, you know, and then, and that's where the focus is right now that, uh, that Michael is, uh, is working on. And, um, and we need the money, you know, uh, we need the, uh, the commitments from those organizations. Money is an interesting thing. 
we obviously can't really take corporate funds or or government funds, right? Because then we're tied, we're obligated. They have a they hand have a hand in what we do. So we uh, we depend heavily on on grants and uh, donations from the member organizations or individual donors, and um, so we're we're making efforts to reach out uh, to raise funds for the work we do as well. Organizers do get paid. Leaders don't. You know, I mean, leaders are have their own jobs and their own work in their own communities. But but uh, we need to support the organizers who really kind of map it out and, and, and gather us and give us the way to go. Interesting. I've got a spam call coming in. I'm just going to decline. <laughs> that. Here we go. Thank you. Uh, maybe the last question I'm going to ask is uh, any strategies? Uh, what strategies has NJ together employed to effectively build a coalition? Yeah. I think I think I'll go back to one of the things I said earlier, listening campaigns. Listen, listen, listen. It's we it's we can't. I mean, it is I mean, if if I come into a community and say, oh, well, you need this, you need that, you need that. That's just me talking. That's just stupid. <laughs> Sorry. But uh, but listen, 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 listen to what people have to say. And then out of that listening, then you can use your organizational power. You can, well, how many answered this to that? You know, you can do the database, you can run the data and you see what issues pop to the top. And then, uh, and then you start looking for leaders who are really concerned about it and can and talk to their friends and say, well, no, listen. And, uh, and then you begin looking at the you know, what could we do to confront it, to change it? What would the ask be? What do we want government to do? Or what do we want the corporation to do? Um, so I, I, think, I think that is the, the, the core strategy um, that is useful to build a coalition. And then a, um, a, strong, a strong organizer uh, has to be involved as well. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, what qualities, um, uh, are, do you believe is most effective for specifically leadership, not organizing, but leaders, community leaders to, yeah, work? yep. The, um, you can't have it all, obviously. I mean, you know, I could list out what a leader is, but for me, what came down immediately is a leader needs energy. Just, just energy. He can't get up in the morning and say, I want to stay in bed. No, he's got to get up. He's got to get his feet on the ground. He needs accountability. Uh, and the fellow leaders need to hold him accountable. You said you were going to do this. You said we were going to have a one-to-one -one with so-and-so. You said you were going to um, try to do some fundraising to get $20,000 from this guy. Did you do it? You know, it has to be accountable. You have to know the tools. I think training is is very important. The idea of relationship building and how to do that. And then the last thing I wrote down for four was self-awareness. You need to know who you are in this community and you need to know all the baggage you carry. <clears throat> so to be a good leader, um, energy, accountability, know the tools and be self-aware. Um, are there leaders of the past or present you feel particularly inspired by? Um... And who's been a good role model? Right. Yeah. The uh, former pastor at the Morristown Uni Unitarian Fellowship, enormous respect for her. Her name was Allison Miller. She now moved out to the West Coast. And they're, they're searching for a new pastor. Um, she was always present. Wherever people were hurting, wherever the issues were, she was present and, um, and, and could speak and could speak and could inspire. Blair Wilson is another who, she is CEO of the Morris Habitat for Humanity. Uh, again, outstanding leader, um, spokesperson steps up to the plate to lead the meetings, to uh, throw out ideas for action. And um, 
again, uh, fully present and fully engaged with our community. Um, you know, good role model leader. I don't know if I have any good role model leaders for, um, well, you know, the question was a role model or guiding light throughout my life. And there is a fellow, I have a close friend. I met him in the industry, known him for 30 years and um, enormously engaging fellow. Always has this big smile on his face. Always brightens my day. And um, he's, he's 10 years older than I am, but he's been a coworker, a manager, a golfer, a confidant. And, you know, it's just someone who I could uh, speak about anything with and, uh, and just love to spend time with him. Uh, uh, for you, how does a typical day look like for you as a, as a community organizer? Yeah, it's, um, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, as, as I, I take my morning walks. I walk a lot. I sometimes say I walk the streets of Morristown and I'll get a lot of people. <laughs> a lot of people will stop and talk to me that I know. I check in with my friends at my own church and neighboring churches. Um, I'll spend time in the library, uh, stop in at a couple of the org other organizations in town. Uh, quite often, I'm, I'll uh, do community outreach at Table of Hope, keep my, keep my feet on the ground. You know, there's some prep for upcoming uh, New Jersey Together meetings. I do chores around the house. Wife expects me to do the dishes. So, you know, I'll get those done. You know, so it's, uh, uh, it's, the, um, it's just living, living, but I'm constantly thinking about you know, who am I going to connect with next? Who do I need to connect with next? And um, how can we move this forward? Uh, uh, any personal goals or motivations within your yeah. organization? Yeah, for my organization, it's extend the one-to-one -one relationships, more one-to-one -one meetings. And um, got one scheduled for tomorrow. You know, it's great. And it's just a fellow I just, you know, ran into used to play volleyball with him before COVID. And now uh, I've just run into him a couple of times and I see he's involved with some other service activities. So we're gonna talk about what I do. And you never know, you just never know. So uh, that's what I'm looking for is more, more of those uh, kind of interactions. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just ask one more. Uh, any like passion projects you're, you're currently like working on? Yeah, my uh, my biggest passion and probably what got me into organizing in the first place is uh, uh, mass incarceration, disparity in prison populations, returning citizens and the barriers they face. You know, African-Americans represent 15% of the population in New Jersey and in the prisons, 60, they represent 60% of the population. Uh, and in Morris County, it's not that much better. That's in my backyard. I thought we took care of this when the sixties, when I was, you know, when we did civil rights and did marches and had laws passed and we took our eye off the ball. So th that's a passion for me. And it's hard. It's a hard nut to crack. It's complicated. But we've been able to elevate this to the state level. And I think, I think if we can get the, the state attorney general, you know, working with us to really explore and understand these disparities. I don't know my role will be in it. But I know uh, I've already met with, uh, with our team, the, the Morris County prosecutor. And of course, no, everything's fine. Everything's fine. There's no disparity in, in his work. There's no bias. Okay. All right. You know, so we just uh, look for the stories and keep, keep persistent. Um. What is the importance of citizen power in our current political moment? 
Uh, citizen power, in my mind, it's the heart of democracy. It's engagement. It's engagement in your life. And if you let other people make the decisions, you're not going to like where you end up. So if you're not paying attention and you're not engaged. And the other thing it is, it helps, it brings us together. There's so many divisive issues in our world today, but you know, citizen power, if you can, if you can focus it on a particular issue, um, and you share you share that concern, and you share the you share the uh, the ask that you're confronting corporations or governments with. If you're involved with that, it brings hope. It brings the idea that change. It brings the hope that change can happen. And so it's democracy, and it's and it's hope. Otherwise, we're just throwing our hands up and say, what can I do? You know, what can I do? I'm just a bystander. And that's just not good enough for me anymore. Um, well, what advice would you give to younger generations for getting involved in your journey together of their own communities and establishing citizen power? Yeah. Younger generations like the three of you, follow your passion, follow your passion. Have the courage to say yes, even when you're scared, but you know it's the right thing to do. And be persistent, don't, don't drop the ball. You know, if you're committed to something, an ideal, stay with it, stay with it. And someone will hear you. And then you have two, and then someone else will hear you. Uh, what, I say? Uh, what mistakes as a future uh, leaders can we avoid making? Don't try to do it all. That's number one. So carve out the space, the niche that you can manage and practice self-care. Do you know what I mean? Take care of yourself, get enough sleep. Uh, have positive relationships around you. Eat well, you know, self-care and read, you know. If you like movies, go to a movie from time to time. Don't, oh. don't forget to take care of yourself. How important do you think reading is for- uh... Reading? Yeah, I, I go in and out of reading. I love movies. Movies are more my favorite, you know, but- uh, uh, some really, really important books, you know, White Rage, Going Public, uh, oh, Maya Angelou, you know, just to understand other cultures, you know, I know why the caged bird sings, you know, these sorts of things. It yeah. again, it's a way of filling my it, a more uh, my world more completely rather than my own little perspective. Uh, did you ever think that you're gonna be like? You today as an organizer when you were growing up? Oh, no. <laughs> well, but and yes, you know, it's no and yes. I mean, I had no idea. Well, you know, I thought I'd be working in Africa, helping impoverished people and helping fix their injuries and cure their, their illnesses. But, um, on the other hand, I can call it faith-centered action. That has always been something that's been part of my life throughout my life. And it, it, it feeds my soul. So it's not surprising that my choices along the way have led me here. So it's not surprising, you know, just knowing who I am and that I always sought out uh, faith-centered choices as a, as a way to, to find my place in the world so it's not surprising that i ended up here anything uh, um is there anything else you would like to add to all this is there anything you think needs to be said yeah um huh. 
I guess it, it's a it's a it's a it's a request for the three of you, you know, and to all the young people, you know, that are going to follow me. Um, I would urge you each to find a way to connect your words and actions to your deepest selves and highest ideals. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, but you have to be true to yourself and to your highest ideal. And sometimes when I'm lost, now from a personal point of view, when I lose my way, if the world is just a mess, nothing makes sense anymore, I become grounded by the words of an Old Testament prophet who said, act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. If I can do that in whatever I'm doing, it's going to be okay. And the other thing I want to say is I really want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to be with you and share a little bit of my story and wish you all the best on your journeys. Yeah, same here. It thank was, you. It was, very, it was very interesting to hear from your perspective. Yeah, great. I think we all learned a lot about not just organizing, but like about how to live a life that's not just helping yourself, but helping others. Yeah. Thank you. It's building community. And uh, I think we all agree that's very important. Uh, yeah, great. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Have a good day. And all right, you as well. Have a good uh, day meeting the other person. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming Thank on. You. Thank you. All right. Take care. You too.